Hello, everyone. I am Rodrigo Silva. I am the Communications Manager at Cogitatio. And I would like to welcome you all to yet another webinar to discuss this time the boundaries between ports and cities and how these two interact uh, with each other. Today's discussion is based on a thematic issue we published early this year on our open access journal, Urban Planning. And the issue was edited by uh, one of our speakers that I introduce now, Carol Ayn, who will open this session when we start. I am also pleased to welcome uh, Hernan Cuevas from the Austral University of Chile. He will be joining us very soon. Amanda Brandelero from the Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and Peter Ash from Hedbald University, also in the Netherlands. Uh, these three are authors of our issue. I am also very pleased to welcome José Sanchez from the NGO AIVP, who will provide a more professional perspective of the topic at hand today. To you all, thank you for joining us. To our attendees, allow me to provide you all with more information uh, concerning today's webinar. So this is the order of presentation. Carola will uh, step in first as academic editor to make a little contextualization uh, about the issue. Then uh, she will be followed by Hernan, Amanda, Peter, then Jose. After that, we will jump to the Q&A session we are with our audience. And so to uh, our attendees, um, you can write your questions to our speakers throughout the whole session using the Q&A format on the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to write the questions throughout the whole session and please indicate the, na the name of the speaker to whom you're directing your question. Also, if you are on Twitter, do feel free to follow Urban Planning at the handle you can see on the bottom of your screen, Cogitatio Up, to be in touch with our publications, call for papers, um, the impact of our research on news outlets, blogs, etc., our events as well. So without further delay, uh, I will pass the word to Carola and I wish you all a very pleasant webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a true pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to share our findings of this special issue. And to introduce you to what this is all about, I would just like to give you a hint, a couple of glimpses of the uh, articles that are in the special issue that we have prepared. So. The question is, first of all, well, what do we rethink when we talk a boundary between port city and territory? So in any case, our call got a very good response. We have 15 articles, 32 authors coming from four continents. So this is definitely a question that touches people in various areas around the world. But what is this all about? Well, first of all, what are port city territories? And here I would say they're a very particular type of space. They're located at the edge of water and land at the edge, and they are a place where ports, where stakeholders with very diverse powers interact. Port authorities are often very powerful entities. They govern a large area of space. They have different planning tools at hand compared to the cities and territories next to them. Now, the idea of this special issue is to say if ports have been built to facilitate flows in particular, then how are they actually bounded? So we, if we want to guide flows, we also need boundaries to contain these flows. But at the same time, these port city territories are also about getting the goods into the hinterland to the people. So it's always this challenge between the facilitating flows and maintaining borders. And this particular relationship has changed over centuries and port cities have traditionally been very good at maintaining these boundaries. So in that context, um, if you're interested, we've also done a special online course about this, which is currently running. Now, the idea to, to give you one bit more idea on what this is all about, let's dive into the various articles that are in the special issue. And I want to just pick up one or two images from each uh, article to give you one additional guiding line that runs through all of them. 
So I think in order to understand this particular connection of port, city, and territory, we really need different methodologies. And among these methodologies is mapping, spatial visualization. So the way that I personally have captured, tried to capture this whole um, continuum from sea to land is in this way. So if we talk about port and city, or if we talk about, we don't just talk about one specific space that is bounded by strong fences, but we talk about a continuum from the ship to the uh, port areas, to the logistics centers, the infrastructures, the hinterland. So this can be in the case of Rotterdam, for example, a port of 50 kilometers length, but reaching some 200 kilometers into the hinterland and reaching way out to sea. The way that we talk about these spaces changes a lot. So we can talk about the physicality of them, but we can also talk about the postcards and the paintings and the different representation. And depending on who you talk to, you will get a very different image of what the ports are actually about. So with that in mind, we send out this idea of asking people to think about porosity from their own perspective using um, some theoretical work in the background. But what I want to talk to you about now is to show you a bit what has come out of it. So this is a question of longevity. So some colleagues analyzed the way that port flows have shaped the hinterland. And one point coming out of it is when you look at the relation between England and the Netherlands, for example, you see a back and forth on both sides of the sea. So we are shifting from a land-based approach to a sea-based approach and the way in which the flows coming from the ships onto the land have shaped the cities and the territories behind. So if you want to look at that even more closely and you can see other types of mapping here in the case of Gdansk, for example, you see how these flows coming in from the sea have reshaped the territory behind it in ever increasing ways, shifting the way in which infrastructure is built, shifting the way in which um, specific rivers are being administrated and so on. So from this large scale of the regional intervention, which we see also, for example, in the, in the case uh, uh, of, of Haifa, we see that there are global links between all of these places. So how can we understand and capture them? So in this case, it is the Chinese port that is being built in this area, which plays a big role in the discussion um, that the authors are having on this particular site. Now, looking at other port cities, and again, staying with this idea, how can we represent those changes through spatial visualization, through mapping? Um, and another set, group of authors has looked at the city of Dunkirk and has explored how petroleum shipping has led to the construction of specific port areas, urban areas, and the hinterland. So we really see how specific flows of goods, in this case oil, has made the city to the point that today the city may not want to give up its oil uh, in order to, because they have, it's embedded in all of its infrastructures, it's embedded in its economy, in the way of living of the people on site. So these uh, types of mapping give you an idea how the cities have been changed at the scale of the region. But you can also dive into this scale much more on a much more smaller scale. So examining how places of water and land intersect can happen at the scale of the human being. So the way in which you can access water, step from the land to the water, can you touch the water? Can a ship be pulled ashore? All of that will change over time and through space. So the authors here made a really intriguing analysis of the ways in which the porosity exists from land and the water edge, how they are connected with water lines, what kind of um, 2D, so mapping based, so, so flat um, changes we see, what kind of edges exist, 
but also the ways whether or not you can get into the water via a terraced form, a slanted form, a slope. And I think this is very important as we think about climate change, for example, if we think about giving more room to rivers, well, how will we access the bottom of a river? When you think about these huge um, cubes that have been piled up on many coasts where you cannot access the sea anymore, there might be much more interesting urban design and urban planning approaches to shaping these areas. So this uh, article gives a really interesting overview of the development of the edges between water and land over time through the example of a specific city. And so you see, if you tr turn that into a more generic or general approach, you actually get questions about who has the right to get to the water. Is this water just for industry or is it actually water for, um, for local people? So each of these articles brings in a different approach, a proposal in terms of how to examine port city territories. Malaga is also explored on a urban scale, regional scale to see how the city and the port have developed together. In the case of Algiers, we see an analysis through different sections. And I think it's very important to think about port cities, not just as flat on the map, but really as being um, three dimensional. So we see here, for example, the section of the land and what you would see from above towards the ground. Now, in, in our piece on straddling the fence, and I have to say I had a lot of fun uh, writing this, it is an exploration also about how the port um, interacts, how different ports intersect in terms of um, the, the, the land use in the port and the land use beyond the port. So actually showing how the if, if, an, if an industry is in a certain position in the port, even though the port doesn't have land use plans, it will shape whatever happens on the other side of the port. So while we might think about ports having very strict boundaries, in reality, they may be much less. So let me give you one or two more examples and then um, uh, show you, and let the, also the, give the room to the other speakers. For example, here, student work um, on rethinking the port, uh, the future port of Kirkenes. We have to think about what to do with this sea land relationship, whether we want to build the ports into the land as we've been doing it for a long time, or whether we need to continue and think about new forms of building ports on the sea. And perhaps they should even be floating ports, as um, Lucas Hala was suggesting. Now, these reflections on how port and city, sea and land intersect, go even down to the level of the, of the structure of the building. So the one more author who looked at the, the pellet domes as the object of the, of the study. So what I try to do right now is give you some insights in terms of the different methodology used by the authors to think port city territory relations through scale from the region to the building over time from the middle medieval period until today and into the future and also bring out that you really need multidisciplinary uh, approaches that is it, it's about space it's about planning tools it's about land use and it's about the culture behind it so I did leave out a few articles, but so that's also because we have our speakers here with you. Uh, and I'm really delighted to have them talk about their own articles rather than me uh, introducing them. So to uh, hand it over now, uh, I will stop sharing and we will go back to uh, Amanda, I would suggest that Amanda now uh, explains, talks about her own work. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just need to move, uh, move the camera back. I'm working on two screens. 
thank you, Carola, for your kind words. Uh, I hope you can all hear me and see my presentation. Um, I'm very honored to be here today and to give you a brief um, summary of a paper I wrote with two colleagues from the Erasmus University, Maurice Janssen and uh, Rosanne van Hauwelingen. Um, and um, our question uh, or our interest uh, was very much connected to what Carola started with in the beginning. So um, how do we represent uh, imaginaries of uh, port city relationships uh, and how do we study um, whether these representations actually, uh, where, where these representations land uh, in real territories. How do we imagine this relationship between the port and the city and how do we actually make it happen uh, in real life? Um, we uh, were very fortunate that actually one of the neighbourhoods in our own hometown of Rotterdam lends itself to this type of analysis and that is the neighbourhood of the Makers District um, in Rotterdam. So I would like to show you how we studied the relationship between these imaginaries, these representations and what is actually happening, the transformations that are taking place uh, in, uh, in the real world. Our paper is entitled uh, Port City Transitions, uh, Past and Emerging Social Spatial Imaginaries and Users in Rotterdam's Makers District. Now, for those of you who are not familiar you to, with... Sorry, do you want to use, uh, show the whole screen? Currently, we see the sideline. Up to you. Okay, I'm not sure why you see the sideline, because I am sharing the whole screen. <laughs> but that's okay, then just continue. Apologies. Okay, this seems to be worse. Yes, so just, just stay with where you were. Um, what Can you see my notes? Yes. Okay. And now? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really see a full screen ahead of me. So <laughs> it also seems to be translating what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I should say I'm using a new work computer, so... Uh, Anyway, this is uh, great for uh, for our speakers who don't uh, <laughs> speak English. <laughs> uh, okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with um, uh, with the Rotterdam Makers District and who are not familiar with its location in the city, uh, it is located just uh, west uh, of the city centre. And you can see here on the two maps, um, first the highlighted centre from a distance, looking at the wider region of Rotterdam, and you can see the port there um, as well, and, and the Hague. Uh, and also um, the zoomed in version, where we highlight the Makers District uh, in the city, separated by the River Meuse um, on both sides uh, of the river, on the, on the northern side, uh, the neighbourhood of Merve Vierhaven and on the, uh, the southern side, um, the neighbourhood of um, RDM. As more functional port activities have moved out uh, of urban harbours and into the city hinterlands, they have left behind spaces of challenges, but also opportunities. And in Rotterdam, these two neighbourhoods, um, Merve Vierhaven and the RDM, are a case in point in such developments. Now they're designated under this umbrella term of the Makers District, so they offer very interesting insights in how um, dynamics of urban uh, waterfront decline and reinvention um, take place. So the Rotterdam Makers District, as I said, is, uh, is a rather a large area situated west of the city, and it received its appellation in 2017 in a strategy document that set out the vision for how this part of the town would be uh, redeveloped. This um, document set out a vision for anchoring the next economy in this particular territory. It's a vision that embodies the ambitions of the city, but also the ambitions of the Port Authority to combine innovative manufacturing, circularity principles, urban living, working environments, while still maintaining a connection to leg legacy of the port and to port activities. Indeed, this area claims to be exploring these innovative um, connections um, and uh, at the same time, it, it is also experiencing a retreat uh, of port activities. It is also interesting uh, in relation to what Carola was saying, because the document itself mentions the notion of boundary. 
it says on the boundary between city and port, outdated port areas offer the perfect condition for an innovation experiment. So there's very much this connection between a boundary situation and the idea of uh, the potential for innovation and experimentation. So what uh, happens when you try to translate these very powerful representations and imaginaries uh, into reality. So we, uh, in our article, we look back at what has been happening in these areas in the last 20 years. We had, uh, we were lucky to have access to data from 2000 onwards um, and up to 2017 that show us what kind of users were moving in and moving out of the area um, and also how they uh, reused uh, very iconic buildings that link to the cities uh, onto the area's uh, portual past. Um, in this uh, picture, I show um, an animation of uh, the movement of users in and out of the area of RDM, so the part that is located in the south uh, of the Makers District. In this um, RDM, for those of you who don't know, um, owes its name to the consortium that settled there in 1902 and that had the aim of addressing uh, the city's seafaring fleet and maintenance uh, and repair needs. So it was very much a shipbuilding um, neighborhood. The consortium soon branched out also to passenger shipbuilding and submarines. Uh, and it also developed into a residential area housing the workers who were um, employed uh, in the shipbuilding activities. So very much the character of this area is very much anchored um, in its shipbuilding um, past. To, um, to this day, uh, this legacy is very, very much visible. Um, and what we see in, uh, in our data is a movement um, out of more traditional, very much shipbuilding relating uh, activities and also oil uh, related activities, cargo handling and wholesale and chemical products have, have moved out. Uh, but we see uh, a moving in uh, of port activities that are much more innovative, also much more anchored in uh, innovative education that is targeting the needs uh, of businesses um, in the sector. So we see some very interesting collaboration taking place here where also um, education and training uh, people um, are, are very much embedded uh, in the businesses and companies um, in the area. If we uh, move to the north, to m um, we see a very different uh, actually situation here. Um, m is a is a neighborhood that is the size of the Rotterdam city center. So it's a really quite a large uh, part of town. And it was formerly the city's energy and transshipment port. Um, you can see uh, remnants of this legacy in its uh, Citrus Veiling building and the Ferrodome, which are buildings that um, are, are iconic reference to the area's legacy as a fruit trade and gas handling and storage center. The area has, uh, because of its location, you can see that it's very close to the city center, also uh, quite well uh, accessible nowadays, has become attractive to uh, people in the creative industries and in small scale manufacturing. And we see um, a, an increase uh, in, in what in this uh, vision document uh, were called the creative pioneers and entrepreneurs. So we really see how this vision that was set out in this document has actually transformed or translated um, in a reality uh, on the ground. This imagine jobs in architecture, writing, graphic design, advertising, but also furniture and accessories, interior design um, and uh, industrial design as well. What we also see here is an emphasis on practices that are circular. So the neighborhood is also trying uh, to embody uh, a vision for a neighborhood that is very much um, future proof, future oriented, um, uh, trying to implement and support practices that enable um, circularity and sustainability. This area, you have to imagine, um, that was once a highly stigmatized part of town. It was an area that was um, a center of uh, where a lot of street prostitution was taking place. Um, and um, we can really see this transformation 
uh, occurring in more recent years. It is now, as I said, quite uh, accessible from public transport. Um, and it is also a rather desirable or becoming a rather desirable part of town. As we see also the uh, city has planned to build up to 5,000 um, houses uh, in, uh, in this neighborhood. Some interesting developments as well we zoomed into it in our paper are um, clusters of creative activities. So in this uh, MFRHA, one interesting example is the Keilerwerf. It is a, a very large uh, building, uh, not terribly inhabitable as I, as I hear, it's rather cold there um, and, uh, and not terribly well insulated, but it, it hosts uh, a number of creative companies. Uh, again, many of them are, are focusing on circularity and sustainable uh, principles. So um, I just want to um, conclude with some, uh, some remarks. Um, our data show uh, that new forms of symbiosis and development are possible between ports and the city. We show how even within the same port city, we can identify quite different trajectories in port city relationships. And obviously you could say this is also related to where these areas are located. And Fierha, very close to the center, rather attractive for new housing developments and um, RDM a bit further out and more interesting from an experimentation um, and innovation perspective. Um, the results show how in the ongoing port city transition in this district, um, we see the combination of, of very clear interventions, more top-down interventions, but also very much bottom-up grassroots developments, like the Kailavera, if I, I mentioned that this, uh, just now, which is very much uh, also the result of the getting together of creative entrepreneurs trying to find uh, suitable places to carry out their activities. Um, so uh, I just want to leave you with, uh, with these thoughts and maybe also with, um, with a question that has intrigued us as well, because in these imaginaries it's also about including, uh, uh, including uh, the diversity of Rotterdam's population and being a very inclusive neighbourhood. But unfortunately our data does not really allow us to make uh, or to draw big conclusions here, but this is something that we'll be monitoring closely in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Amanda, for your presentation. We will now be hearing from Peter Ash. Yes, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Um, greetings from Nijmegen, actually. And as you can see in the background, maybe also greetings from Shanghai in uh, China. Uh, I'm presenting one of the articles uh, contributing to this special issue, uh, which is less an article, uh, which was um, using mapping exercises, at least not spatial mapping exercises, um, to map out uh, the transitions which are, uh, which can be observed in, uh, in harbor cities and particularly in port city interfaces. Um, what we rather did, and I have to say, who did this, uh, of course, first of all, this uh, is a PhD student uh, at our uh, Department of Geography, Planning and the Environment, Yu Yi Zhang, or Kara for European ears, it's, it's maybe better to use Kara Zhang, um, who is doing this uh, research, um, comparing and looking in particular at the innovation ecosystems uh, which are evolving at port city interfaces uh, using Rotterdam and Shanghai as two cases. And when we received the invitation to think about porosity of border spaces, uh, we thought that the case of Bao Shan in Shanghai is actually a good case to um, look at those uh, porosity aspects. Um, we are different in, in such a uh, way that um, our analysis is less looking into the speciality um, of the things which are going on on the ground, but we rather have an industrial and uh, institutional viewpoint, uh, which we developed and tried to elaborate. Um, in uh, addition, our analysis of borders um, is uh, guided by uh, a kind of combination of various uh, theoretical perspectives, um, which can be in short summarized as uh, the 
construction of borders, the active construction of borders uh, through actors and their relations which they constitute, the acceptance of uh, the general system of flows which is shaping in particular uh, the specific situation of ports uh, as we would say. And the last point uh, is something which uh, is uh, related to its actors in particular and to their perspective which they extend to the border space. Uh, it's uh, again a bit of a tricky theoretical conceptual idea which is called penumbral uh, but this penumbral uh, dimension is allowing actors uh, in border settings which are uh, specifically making up these port city interfaces to negotiate and renegotiate actually the interpretation uh, of the specific setting which they find uh, uh, or which they are confronted with. So these are uh, at the outset uh, some reservations which I also have to make uh, in terms of our case. Again, as a repetition, Bao Shang is, uh, is uh, a larger part of uh, Shanghai, around 2 million inhabitants living there. It's an area of 270 square kilometers uh, in size. It was and used to be formed uh, largely by steel industries, uh, and Bao Steel, for instance, uh, is probably known uh, by some of the people listening to this uh, webinar. Uh, and it is an area which is under transition uh, due to the fact that uh, the steel industry is pulling out of this area. Other industrial activities are moving in, but also the city is moving in into this area and trying to, yeah, to turn over uh, this uh, interface, as we would say, uh, into something new. Now, we had uh, two questions actually, um, of, uh, which were presented to us at the beginning of, uh, in preparation for the seminar. Uh, the first should, uh, should outline a bit of the findings. Uh, well, looking at these, uh, at our analysis and the case which we which we studied, uh, this aspect of uh, the border space which you can find in these port city interfaces is of course particularly interesting, as I also outlined at the beginning. And when we looked into this, um, the question for us uh, was you know, how do, in particular, the various actors which are coming together at this space are uh, negotiating and renegotiating this uh, um, border area? And in particular, what have been the perspectives uh, of these different actors? And it was interesting to see that actually, uh, to a larger degree, an unawareness of the respective other sides uh, was guiding the uh, the activities and the actions uh, which uh, which shape this area from uh, the uh, the uh, port authority uh, on the one side uh, towards the municipality on the other side, plus a multitude of actors in between these two two broad uh, in, in between these two pillars, as as I might say. Um, so that was one of the things uh, which were, uh, was irritating us and uh, the second thing uh, we tried to look into was uh, related towards the industry and uh, despite the fact also that uh, some of these industrial activities were clearly post in place in this harbour area and attention of the harbour area in itself was also at times largely missing uh, or on the other hand also an attention of the city approaching this harbour area was missing. So this was the second irritating uh, pers uh, perspective and, and finding which we, which we had. Now we tried to, there's of course more, uh, we contributed an article uh, in which you can read of course more about the, the other results as well. Uh, but in terms of the, the, you know, what sort of implications do we have with these findings, it's good to, or I can actually uh, reconnect to Amanda and also to Carola uh, with, uh, in, in one aspect in particular, and the aspect is related towards the speciality of, of these initiatives uh, or of these harbor settings. And um, we come up with something slightly different, which is focusing clearly on the perspective which actors take in these uh, settings. Uh, and we say um, that uh, actually the, the spatial transformation, which is so, so central in, in most of the other 
um, um, articles from our uh, point of view is actually secondary. So, and especially if you want to, as a planning institution, and now I'm talking as a professional here, so as a, with uh, planning as a professional back background, uh, that's of course an interesting finding because our intention is usually to draw lines and to shape things in, in a physical way and uh, uh, to shape the materiality of this. Uh, these spaces, but in our uh, findings, we come to the conclusion, okay, it is actually the direct spatial transformation is probably uh, secondary, in particular, if you have strategic intentions. So, and these strategic intentions, which are then using this porosity, this penumbral setting in a harbor area and in this uh, port city interface can be strategically used in a much better way by focusing first and foremost on the actor perspectives and then, so to say, progress into the shaping of tangible and intangible borders, which we need to talk about. Um, so, what we did, for instance, and now I also briefly share uh, my screen with you. Um, I learned during this session that it is possible to share the screen. Um, I hope this is working now. Do you see my full page or just the slide? Jan, we see the whole desktop. So if you can... The whole desktop. Perhaps, then yes, I need so to you do can enlarge else. a little bit the image. Uh, you should actually see this here. It's not the full desktop anymore. It's still uh, still everything. Okay. Now, if you can enlarge a little bit the image, just to be yes, more clear. Yes, I will. Wait, wait. Or you can launch you Perfect. can launch the full screen uh, next slide. Yes. Perfect. Um, today, my system seems to be a little bit irritated by this webinar because we, at the preparation, we already had a, a mirror. Uh, issue, issue. But now you see what we did, for instance, we mapped out, for instance, uh, institutional and, and industrial actors within uh, in our uh, empirical part. And the, uh, this is simply what we did uh, in this uh, in, for, for the research. And two, uh, I would uh, in particular address uh, one thing, and this is, uh, this, is uh, this connection here between various institutional actors, but also various industrial actors, which are connected uh, within this uh, 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 port city interface. And where due to our uh, analysis, for instance, uh, this perspective of uh, taking porosity uh, as an active factor and as a strategic element could actually le lead from contradictions, which you see here uh, mapped out in these relations, towards strategic cooperations. This is what I wanted actually uh, just to demonstrate uh, with this, uh, I admit, rather complex network analysis. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's my contribution towards this uh, uh, webinar today. And I'm looking forward to your questions as well. Thank you, we'll get to them certainly. Thank you very much, Peter, for your presentation. We will be now hearing from Hernan. Thank you, Anand. If you can unmute your microphone first. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Um, thank you for waiting for me, first of all. Uh, I was in a different uh, meeting and, and, and yeah, uh, <laughs> I got kind of stuck there. Okay. Well, um, our, the presentation I will do uh, it, uh, is a part of a, a product of a collaborative project with uh, two other researchers, uh, Jorge Budrovic and uh, Claudia Serra. Um, it makes sense to say a little bit about them, actually, because uh, Claudia is a rural sociologist and she did most of the work on, on, on what is the, the the rural areas surrounding the, the central part of Chile, you know, and then the agribusiness uh, part of the of the research. Um, whereas the other uh, uh, researcher, uh, Jorge Budrovich and uh, and myself, we did lots of work on on the. Um, um, sorry, there is something.
this is a kind of problem so you know we do have normally um, in this uh, this cinematic way of working you know? Do you like us to proceed? So, uh, oh, okay. Good. No, no everything was it's okay now. So uh, Jorge and I did uh, our research on, on, on mostly on the city port of uh, of uh, Valparaiso. Okay, the research we we have conducted uh, has to do with the role of the territory and the hinterland in relation to the development of the the port city of Valparaiso, which is located in the central uh, area of, of Chile. And, and this is uh, mostly an area which is uh, a, characterized by its uh, productivity in terms of uh, agriculture. It is part of the big agribusiness uh, industry in the world, actually, uh, nowadays, I would say. Uh, many of you, maybe in Europe, do eat uh, some of the the, the 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 grapes that uh, have been produced in this area, for instance, no, uh, and many of you maybe have uh, or did have the experience of drinking Chilean wines that is also produced in this particular area, or some of the avocado which is being produced in this area as well. So I guess that the one of the main uh, issues for us was to to try to. Uh, consider how this uh, uh, international insertion of uh, the Chilean economy, which started some three decades ago, um, uh, somehow produced uh, uh, a restructuring of the, 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 um, of the economy in the central area of Chile. And that particular restructuring has Lots to do with uh, the uh, effects on the on the port city itself, um, particularly all projects relating to the expansion of the port in order to uh, um, receive this massive uh, 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 ships, um, particularly container ships, in front of a rel relatively small bay. Valparaiso do have an impact on the waterfront you know? and they do have an impact as well in the construction on the area. So our approach then to the um, problem of uh, porosity in the city has actually to do with the uh, interrelation, so to say, of the uh, economic needs you know, of the economic sector particularly agribusiness you know, that exports mostly in, in, in containers you know, and, and, and requires as well you know, a, a lots of areas for handling these containers in front of the, a, of the bay. And on the other side, you know, the demands of the city for access you know, to the bay, access to the ocean, you know, and that creates lots of tension in, in the city. So in terms of the, uh, the, the general problematic that we addressed in our paper, I would say we study the relations between the hinterland and the particularities of the, uh, the, the waterfront and the bay. And on the other side, the kind of uh, problematics that that particular relation address, you know, to the development of the city. Because what we have found is that um, there is a certain uh, problem of environmental justice on the one side, and on the other side, there is also a, a disharmony, so to say, between the development of the economic sector, in particular, the uh, development of the port, which is a, a, a rather small port, but very, very, very efficient and, and modern in, 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 in a process of modernization, of continuous modernization. But on the other side, you do have, you know, local impacts on the city that does not develop, that, uh, that uh, 
um, does not take, you know, any of the benefits, or, or that is partly, you know, the main uh, the main discourse of the, 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 the those who are critics of the the, the development of the um, of the port. Uh, that very little of the benefits produced by the port and by the agricultural industry is being uh, somehow cut then by the local communities in Valparaiso. And the question then of, uh, of porosity has to do with that as well, because um, the, the need of the, the, the port of um, increasing you know, the, the, the productivity of the port has to do as well with the uh, infrastructure uh, and the newer and newer infrastructure in the, in the area that affects as well uh, the, 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 the plans of growth of the city. Mm -hmm. Being such a small bay, most of the people do think that uh, uh, the growth of the um, of the, the port and the construction of a new uh, container terminal might create you know, more problems of access uh, to, to the ocean for locals and might create more problems as well of pollution, air pollution and difficulties in, in terms of uh, uh, the design, also environmental risks relating to tsunamis in, 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 in the future. Um, we have uh, lots of data uh, that show us, you know, how the levels of the sea are increasing as well. The number of uh, of um, uh, uh, of shock waves, you know, in in, in the, the whole littoral of the area, and and I'm sure that uh, Jose knows quite a lot about that, you know, in terms of uh, the, the 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 situation of um, of Valparaiso. And just a last uh, comment relating, you know, to the um, patrimonial uh, status of Valparaiso, which is a city um, that um, has an international recognition as a UNESCO heritage site. Um, and in particular, the historical site you know, of, uh, of, the, of the port, it is uh, just in front of the, of, of the, 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 the current uh, operations, port operations. Um, and somehow, I think that the experience of Liverpool, the, the recent experience of Liverpool, which was uh, damaging, you know, uh, to the city, uh, somehow has to be taken seriously into account, you know, in the case of Valparaiso. Because uh, I think that we are maybe running a similar, uh, a similar risk. And, now I guess it is the the the, the challenge for um, the uh, the challenge of uh, 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 urban studies people and, and architects, uh, but also you know the 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 companies um, producing you know this uh, an infrastructure investments in the in the area to produce a, 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 a project of port development that actually takes into account as well in a collaborative manner um, the feelings of the city, so to say, of the communities and what are their needs. And I guess that the concept of porosity actually presents then a brilliant opportunity to consider how collaborative can be as well a project, a new project of expansion of the port, which is a need for the whole area, but now, and in difference uh, from what has been the, the case until now in, in Valparaiso, considering more participatory uh, processes with the community, with the local communities. And I guess that the, the notion of porosity is a notion that can somehow connect uh, the local communities and their needs with the uh, idea of port development. Okay, I leave it there and thank you very much.
and thank you very much for your presentation. We will be hearing now from uh, Jose Sanchez from AIVP. Thank you. Uh, well, um, hello everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you to Cuditatio Press and Carola for inviting us to join this, um, this event. Uh, I think they are, I, I was also lucky enough to be one of the reviewers of uh, some papers in this, uh, in this call, not any of the ones presented here today, but I, I have to, to say that uh, from non-academic perspective, the idea is, I would say, quite provoking in the sense, uh, uh, it's provocative uh, uh, in terms of including a concept such as porosity that uh, is suggestive, I would say, in terms of how we should define the porosity relationship. Um, I would like to share my screen. Um, so I, I hopefully it works. Please let me know if you see it. You're loading. Is it working? From my part, it's still loading, I think. Uh, now it is, yes. Okay, still I think is the uh, full, now it's full screen? Oh, it's full screen, yes. Okay, good. Uh, just a brief coming of why uh, I think uh, Carola and Puditadio Bruce decided to include us. Uh, I work, my name is Jose Sanchez, and I work for an uh, international uh, nonprofit organization that is called AAVP. I think it's probably best known outside the academic world, though we do work with uh, academia quite often. Just to give you, I'm not going to, to use a lot of time, but here we are, um, how we are it, present in the world. We have been working on this topic for over 30 years, first on water from regeneration, now really on sustainable port city um, relationships. And um, among the members, there are some of the ports that have been uh, commented uh, today. Now, I don't want to, to extend myself, we have a limited time. So I'm just going to share the two images that I think capture a bit the challenges that are in the port city relationship. One is this one that I like to use. I have used uh, several times uh, and those that know me uh, probably have seen it already. This is Hamburg. This is, by the way, where I'm calling you from. Not from the plane, but from, from the port city. And I like to use this image always because I think it shows quite well this um, complexity of the territory. Um, and it goes a bit on, or builds a bit on what has been said already about this ecosystem of actors, <coughs> sorry, and complex territories. And also that there is a certain tension or competition for this what is going to happen on the waterfront. And um, I think it leaves a bit uh, space for reflection on how difficult it can be for the actors that are involved here in relevant positions, as Carol was saying, uh, such as port authorities. Although I may discuss that they are powerful, but not as powerful as many, uh, many people uh, consider. And this is another uh, image that is completely different, which is in Lisbon, my hometown, some years ago, where um, the expansion of the port became a political conflict. Uh, or a political discussion, I would say, at the very least, uh, with different parties wanting to use it uh, as a, um, uh, how to put it, as a gun against the others, uh, um, and, but also underneath showing that some people are for the port expansion because they do create certain wealth, uh, particularly in the jobs that are uh, assigned. To it. And I, I always like to use these, these two images because it reveals a bit the tension. And I think this is probably the, the the start, uh, the, the start point of, um, of all this, the tension. The tension because we talk about complex ecosystem of actors that are trying to develop different, sometimes competing um, activities in a coveted territory such as it is the waterfront. Uh, for ports, it's necessary to have this access. We have seen also that is where um, certain imaginaries may, uh, may be developed in a specific way, also because there are uh, historical roots about um, historical roots on the definition of the port city, on the identity, the culture, and, and so on. But also because it's where uh, sometimes we identify the source of many of the problems that we see today about environment or environmental externalities caused by these activities. Uh, but also it has been placed as the engines for economic growth. So we see all these different dimensions taking place here. Additionally, we also have the political conflict that I was just saying. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the other 
regional or national tensions, because I think we already mentioned here the importance of the hinterland and um, how the how the reading or the interpretation of the port city relationship should not be reduced to uh, the immediate border that is between these two entities, if we could call them that, like this. Um, so I, I use this, this idea as the uh, carryover to the second part of the comment that I wanted to make. Uh, when, when, I don't know if it was Carola or the editors chose this concept of porosity, I think it's, uh, it's interesting because it connects to a, a larger, I think more, even more academic debate about the definition of what is the interface. And this is something that we also see in the porosity relationship on the everyday basis, not just in the academic um, research, in the sense that should we only focus on the border or should we talk about the hinterland or should we talk and when we talk about the hinterland are we talking about just the neighboring regions where we have the industries that are active or should we talk about hundreds of kilometers away which then uh, leaves us interesting questions such as what is the port of the Czech Republic and is actually Hamburg so it even raises much but even beyond what uh, what we usually see of course when we talk about porosity is not just also a uh, about the physical boundary, but it's also, we need to take into account the um, positive and negative externalities of the port activities over this much broader territory. So here uh, we go again to the discussion about what is the interface. So it's not just the physical interaction between the mode of transportation that are connected in these supply chains to the port, but it's also about how these uh, potential externalities may affect a certain area. And this, of course, raises uh, other issues and uh, uh, using uh, building on, on, on academia and some papers from some years ago, they were saying that actually there is the industries in Bayern, in uh, Bavaria, benefit more from the activities in the part of Hamburg than the people of Hamburg in itself. So, of course, when we talk about this porosity, we have to think also on the economic level, we have to think on the environmental level and the, uh, all the social cultural um, activities that are also relevant about this porosity and this transparency. What is, uh, what is interesting also is that we see a constant evolution, which is also one of the, uh, I would say, key uh, features of port cities, that they are in a constant evolution in terms of the configuration of the physical space, but also in terms of the actors that actually play a role in the configuration of this space. And this is interesting because it's placed them in the um, magnifying glass on, of global processes that have already been discussed, I think, in some of these, of these papers. And both from the um, evolution on, of the economic productive models and how our society works, but also on the challenges that we're going to see into the future. And I will get back to that in the uh, final moments of the reflection. So, um, like I said, they are in, in this, um, in this, under this uh, magnif magnifying glass, and we see this evolution. So what we see uh, and what we are analyzing today builds on this evolution, the changes that have occurred over the past decade, over the past centuries or millennia, if we go to some cities in the Mediterranean Sea, for example, because it is, they, this is where we find indeed some of the roots of, that characterize the positive relationship today they can stretch as far as, uh, as to this point. What we see also in this evolution, and this is not to defend the members of AADP, um, to put it quite blatantly, we see that for several decades during the 20th century, the, our 19th and 20th century, there was a certain disregard towards the potential consequences of these activities over the territory, in the sense that the, uh, the dominating um, speech or discourse was growth at any cost. And this was not just in port cities, this was again a global, um, a global narrative that we have seen uh, for, for decades. Partly because it was the economic, let's say that the economic growth would justify any kind of consequence, and partly because there was a certain lack of knowledge regarding the consequences of, this, um, of these consequences. What we see also, and going back to the idea of evolution, is the fact that um, the things are changing. We see uh, since in, in 1987, we see the Brendel report that sets, uh, uh, let's say, the starts to be the global debate, even though we can argue that it was 
farther in, uh, it was longer uh, taking place already some decades ago before that, but we see this global initiative. And we see that gradually we start to, to get a certain conscience on the effects that this economic growth and the, the physical transformation of our urban settings to potentiate this urban growth, what are the consequences that they are having? And we are learning today. We are learning today what are these, um, these consequences in our daily lives. And in fact, we are starting to feel the pressure, albeit too slow, on the changes that we have to do uh, in our daily lives and also in port cities. So what we see um, is that there is an increasing pressure on the key actors that operate in the port city ecosystem to do certain changes. And this is, um, of course, this is a bit defending our own work. We want to believe that AVP is playing a certain, even minimal uh, role in, in this, at least of increasing the, um, the, the awareness of what is, uh, what is actually happening. And what we see is that these, uh, the poor actors are starting to take this into, into account. Uh, it's not, there is still much uh, a long road to, to go and long road to, to travel until we really uh, are in a, in a position where we can congratulate ourselves. But still, it is, um, it is uh, uh, an evolution in that sense. However, and here is a bit connecting to, to what Perola was saying. I, I think you said right at the beginning, Perola, that uh, port authority is powerful actors. And uh, both you and me know that uh, the port city ecosystem is formed by a large complex uh, um, set of, of actors. But since they are installed in these global supply chains, they do not uh, have the power that they may have had in the past. So this is also important. It's something that we see how there are global actors that have a very strong influence on what is going to happen in the port city development and in the relationship that is, um, that is there. Um, I have uh, uh, some other ideas, but unfortunately don't think we have the time, but there are just two, uh, two or three key points that I would like to, to leave. Um, one is, uh, about the process of demaritimization that we, are, we have seen in port cities for quite a long period and connects a bit to the issue of the lack of porosity. The fact that there was this lack of porosity actually accelerated the social disconnection with the port activities in itself. We, I think in some of the, of the, um, of the papers was already uh, quite uh, clearly said that there was a certain organic relationship and this broke. And there, is, there are also certain efforts to recover this, particularly in terms of governance. And this is a bit to answer some of the observations that were made by, by the authors. What we have seen, and we're talking about the last uh, three, four years, not more than that. So it is an ongoing evolution, an ongoing change. We see that there are um, initiatives very often led by the port authorities that have to bridge between these global actors and what the local uh, society wants in order to have a more engaging and more open governance process that allow the people to actually express and influence the idea of how a port city should be and how a port city vision should, uh, should occur. But then I, uh, since I think I have to finish because uh, uh, we have to end into the final 10 minutes and, and q and I want to, to, to make this one small open observation. Uh, again, connecting with the idea of port city porosity and port city interface. We have here, um, been talking about mostly, I think, the physical transformation of the space and the, con and the consequences of port activities for the people that live either in the vicinity of uh, the port activities, both in the city and in the, uh, in the interface, even though, even also discussing how the expectations um, and uh, the, uh, the ideas, the precast ideas that people may have to what should happen in an area may influence the governance and planning process. There is yet another layer of this complex interface that we are facing or that we're seeing and yet opens the debate for a further porosity, which is about the interaction between smart ports and smart city. So how is this new layer of the interface, which is based on data and it, it is not visible because at the end, environmental consequences are actually visible. How is this new level of interaction going to occur 
in the port cities of, of the future. So I leave this a bit uh, an open question to my colleagues that are much cleverer than, than I am. So I hope they can help me answer it. Jose, thank you very much for your presentation for this uh, overview. Before we jump to the Q&A, Carola, I believe uh, some uh, final remarks. Yes, uh, very briefly, and I already um, greeted our fellow authors in the chat. So we have several more of the special issue authors with us, Rui Yue, Yvonne, um, uh, who else I already saw. So it's great to have you here. Uh, and I'm also delighted to have um, another, have Christian Moreno from the port of Valparaiso here. So we can actually discuss this. And I thought since uh, he was he is here, I'm just going to very briefly share my screen again. As I said, we've been organizing this course on reimagining port cities exactly with this idea that we need more knowledge on the city side of, and the regional side of the port and of the port to what the city does and uh, using among others mental mapping as a method. And, and hopefully Christian, it's okay if I share this now. So this was the idea of the porosity and actually already using this concept in uh, the different um, concepts of how to see a port, whether it's a fluid port, whether it's a rigid port. So I thought this was a nice idea to rethink the different ways how land and sea are interconnected, interrelated, also in this very particular setting of the uh, amphitheater. Uh, that Valparaiso is with its heritage sites and so on. So that is also, um, I thought it would be a nice idea to just connect people in the room, but we may want to move to the, you might want to use the, the, the questions and answers then. Thank you, Carola, for these concluding remarks. Um, Tiago has kicked off the Q&A uh, segment with a question for Carola, but I think it's very relevant to hear from uh, the remaining speakers about this. Some of them, Hernan, I recall, uh, touched upon this. So the question is, how will climate change influence the import importance of ports worldwide? And what role can they play in climate uh, change adaptation? And for all of you, uh, perhaps starting with Carola and following the same order of presentations, uh, in your research, your experience, these new planning strategies for port regeneration, do they take into consideration the more than expected uh, rise of the sea level? Well, when you look at activities in individual ports, in port associations, everybody is focused on sustainable development. It needs to happen, but it's very difficult to get away from a fossil fuel driven economy where we have all these structures that are but the ports are floating on oil in, in, in many ways. So, but they need, they are at the forefront of climate change and sea level rise. Although sometimes as in Rotterdam, the ports level is actually higher and will be flooded after the city itself. Cities also have, an, have sustainable movements and uh, energy, uh, engage in energy transition. I think what's often missing is the connection between port, city and territory so that they can collectively address this issue. So one, maybe one more point on this, I do believe that coastal and port city territories are the stewards of this transformation. So they need to come together with all the various stakeholders. And, and as, um, as uh, Jose said, they're much more, that there's also global actors involved, but it's about finding or returning to the local value of the value for the, the local value of the port, the port is a local, um, contribution to the territory and not just a global one. And that is this, uh, I think it's a very difficult balancing act, but it's necessary if we want to address climate change in, um, and we need to address climate change. So I do think that ports have a very important leading role in there to play together with the cities and territories around it. Thank you. Amanda, can we hear your takes on this as well, uh, related to your research? You've said, you've said Amanda, isn't it? Okay. I said Amanda. I said Amanda. I'm sorry. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was also wondering. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, um, the Makers District in, in Rotterdam is also uh, very much framed as um, a, a space to test uh, new ways of, uh, of uh, adaptation, of transition uh, in urban settings. 
Uh, so companies are also encouraged to uh, adopt a circularity principle at the core, at the start, um, rather than uh, you know thinking about how to integrate these uh, these questions later on when it's maybe. Uh, as Kerala said, once you're stuck in particular ways of doing it, it's a bit harder to integrate um, such principles. So I think that's also part of the experimentation of, of, of this area. Still early days to see um, you know, how much impact it will have and also how much impact it, uh, on the overall city it will have. But I think it's, it's very important to have these testing grounds um, in, uh, in cities. And I think these transition spaces offer these opportunities to try things out, to be experimental, to be a bit daring. And that's what we need right now. Thank you, Amanda. Hernan, now you touched upon this, uh, this topic in your presentation. Can you explore a little bit more this uh, climate change education? Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. Yeah, Christian also mentioned this and, and in, in, the, uh, in the chat. Uh, Cristian Moreno, he works in the, he's uh, an urbanist, he works in, in the uh, main port company, this is uh, the, 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 the land road, so to say, company in, in, in the Paraiso. Huh? The, um, and what, what is, uh, I guess, the challenge for, for porosity uh, uh, as, as a concept um, is also to consider uh, not only movement, and access, but also sightseeing, visual porosity, so to say. And, and I guess that the, that opens more possibilities because um, one has acknowledged that uh, Valparaiso is uh, mostly a container shipping uh, uh, port. And, and that actually is a, a restriction as well for what sort of development is possible uh, there, you know, in terms of, our, of poros, porosity, so to say. Um, I tend to think that it is a completely different from uh, the case of a cruiser terminal, for instance. A cruiser terminal has less impact, I would say, in sightseeing and the city uh, as well. Uh, I tend to think that the, the uh, problem of the Terminal 2, which is being uh, now discussed exactly in this moment, I would say, it, it has to do mostly with the uh, identity of the city and the relationship, you know, to its terminal and, and its uh, hinterland as well. If there are other alternatives, I would say I would rather go for a different place, not Valparaiso as the main uh, possibility for the uh, expansion of a, a, a container terminal because of its uh, heritage uh, status. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have there, you know, relatively close to Valparaiso, San Antonio, for instance, which is uh, maybe 30 or 50 miles south. No, no, and, and, and there is a, uh, uh, I would say there is a problem there, you know, that one needs to tackle. But the main problem in Chile is actually that we do not have a national authority that somehow is able to um, coordinate and articulate the different projects that are being put forward by the different companies. And, and there, there is a certain lack of that particular governance um, for, the, for the whole development. And, and if being here, Christian, I would rather ask him as well, what does he think about this? Because um, uh, um, I guess that the, 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 the same needs that need to be fulfilled in terms of uh, uh, industrial development and agribusiness could be also being fulfilled elsewhere. Um, that is something I, I want to say as something that is somehow irritates a bit, I know, and uh, it can be, you know, as well, you know, somehow uh, controversial for local authorities, uh, because most of the uh, decision makers, I guess, are kind of putting uh, forward, you know, the notion of the port city of Valparaiso as a container uh, port mostly. Thank you, Hernan. Uh, Peter, uh, focusing on your research uh, on Shanghai, what can we, what can we hear about it? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, of course, the uh, the issue of uh, sustainability is uh, is uh, a present issue for various actors. 
the municipality of Shanghai is certainly uh, very much interested in, in issues of uh, sustainability, which leads them, for instance, also uh, to, well, I wouldn't say conflicts, but of course, into the strategic uh, decision making processes, which are then uh, making bows to you, for instance, move out to other locations and to transplant uh, the polluting activities, for instance, then towards other or tenants, uh, potentially polluting act activities to other places outside of Shanghai. Uh, what we also learned is, of course, that smaller companies um, uh, are um, very much uh, driven uh, by environmental requirements and the questions of uh, achieving certain uh, sustainability standards. So that's, uh, that's something which is, uh, is very present in the, uh, in the discussion which we have there. What we need to understand, however, is also that, of course, the, all the ports in Shanghai are also partly an element of, uh, let's say, national politics. Uh, so five-year plans for the entire state of China, uh, they are, uh, of course, driven by other dynamics as well. And, uh, and in that context, a port like Shanghai, or several ports in Shanghai, including also Baoshan, then play, uh, in particular, still a developmental role. Yeah, so in terms of technologies, in terms of uh, shifting borders towards new activities, technologically driven activities. Um, so that's that's our perspective. I would like to emphasize one thing, and that came from uh, Jose. In particular, I think this uh, this interface is certainly very important, also from that perspective. I mean, we. Uh, we should not focus in all these dimensions only on the immediate interface, which is defining, let's say, porosity or non-porosity. Um, in particular, if we take this idea of flow into mind, uh, into uh, account, then we need to think about larger relational spaces. And I just drop here one large scale project in which uh, also Shanghai is playing a role. And this is the Belt and Road Initiative. So which is really a global project in which all these places uh, uh, play an, a, a role. Yeah. So that's that's my okay. comment and contribution. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, Jose, can we hear from you as well of this? Yeah. Um, so the many things that that I would like to to say connected to the intervention of, of the different uh, colleagues, um, I go through them very quickly. One of them is regarding the issue of the different levels of governance that Hernan was was suggesting, and this is always a controversial issue because. Uh, if we uh, speak with certain actors in, in some countries, they will complain that there's a lack of a national authority. If we speak with the actors uh, in others, they will say, well, the national authority is enforcing certain strategies in our territory. We don't have the freedom to be kinder or invest more in the, in the local community. So it, it raises a lot, of, a lot of, uh, of debate that unfortunately I don't have the time. We don't have the time to, to get into them. Uh, the other issue, um, Peter was saying something that is that is very relevant, and it connects a bit to the global connections that are established and how they are also part of not just commercial uh, logic, but also political uh, um, issues. And this, this problem of the Belt and Road, we can see that then, for example, when uh, Costco bought the uh, uh, Port Authority, of, uh, of Piraeus, then uh, the decisions that is going to influence the port city of Piraeus are not going to be taken, not even in the capital in Athens, but they're going to be taken in a different country, the other side of the world, responding to completely different priorities. And, uh, uh, and here in Hamburg, we just had this uh, uh, five past weeks where um, also uh, there was a Chinese company for the first time entering into the capital of Hala, which is the terminal operator here that until now was only uh, German. So it, it raises a lot of questions in many different uh, uh, levels beyond the immediate, the immediate context. And finally, just to, to uh, discuss about the issue of climate change, which was, I think, the, the original questions. Uh, yes, port cities are at the forefront of this, uh, of this problem. Uh, it's not just about the rise of the sea level. Um, is a, when we talk about climate change, it's about uh, adaptation and mitigation. So yes, adaptation, it will be the problem of immediately 
preparing the territory to respond to extreme weather events and the sea level rise and so on. But it's also about how are the mitigation, um, so how can we reduce the, uh, the impact of climate change in the longer term? How can we reduce basically the impact of our own activities and the influence they have in the changes that we see in, in the climate? And here is where um, I, I conclude a bit more on, on saying, port cities are not just the hubs or they have been the hubs for um, global economic processes. And this, I think Hernan said quite clearly at the beginning, there are hubs of the transition. And I think in the uh, paper from Amanda, we could see very well how they are also places of experimentation, but they are also, I would say the key points in which the uh, one action is going to have further consequences due to the network nature of, of these places, of these ports and, uh, and, and these cities. So this is why I believe that uh, port cities play a very relevant role in the global uh, uh, struggle, in, in the global evolution, the global uh, path effort towards, uh, towards sustainable development and responding to the issue of, of climate change. There are cases, uh, just to address, because I think there was some, some question, there are uh, good cases that we see. The problem that we see and this is another, it opens yet another dimension, is that we see very different speeds in terms of the changes and how they are taking place. So when we talk about uh, uh, some ports, it looks like we're comparing Formula One uh, to use a, a, a auto, uh, automobile car uh, metaphor. We see that is a comparison between Formula One drivers going 350 kilometers an hour and some others are with the bike that is not even electric and they are struggling to keep up uh, so it is about how do we integrate or how do we prepare global responses in the local context in port cities that are in Rotterdam as a, a very advanced case, but others that are in locations that are, do not have these same resources because the challenges are going to be very similar. They are basically the same. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much. Very uh, clarifying. I would perhaps um, close the webinar with a question directly to Carola. Uh, the, most part of our audience today is uh, academic. And in the beginning, you gave a um, great wide overview of the whole issue uh, when we started. So the question is now, Carola, what now? If you had to launch another issue today on this topic, what would your angle be? So what is the next step in Port Cities research? Well, that's an, that's an excellent question, I have to say. I think when we launched this special issue, it was a bit fishing. And that's also uh, how the first round of papers came back. And I should probably admit that most of these papers went at least through three revisions. And I kept on pushing each of the authors to engage with the concept of porosity. And I think that's also what you see in the final results. In the end, everybody came up with another angle to it. But thanks to this, this, this careful searching from so many brilliant minds, I think we have a much better grasp of what porosity is, what it can be, and how it can enrich both the theoretical academic discussions and I think the professional engagement. And that gets me back to what um, Jose was just saying, because I've always struggled with this concept of the interface. And it has many benefits, it has there's lots of great writing about it, but it limits our mind to certain images and maybe I'm too much of a visual person but what we see with the idea of porosity is that we need viscosity we need areas that can go back and forth like you imagine a river that is flooding for some time and disappearing and this concept of the interface I think limits us in thinking of a straight line at least that's what it does for me and that's exactly the reason why I tried to develop a more spatial approach with different areas and have tried to describe it as something that is much th that we can see in space and that's much more complex as a single line and I think Amanda's uh, analysis shows you exactly that we have a whole area the size of the city of Rotterdam that is show, showing a back and forth of port and city related activities. We cannot define these as a pure line. And this is, I think also, and, and, and so that I think is an important point. So we should really go on and discuss this further, theorize it further and get more examples. 
And that gets me actually to the second point. And um, again, also a reflection, maybe a comment back to Jose, the, the comparability. So port cities are so fascinating because on the one hand, they are linked by the same global big players. And we had in our course, have it, people map stakeholder maps of their cities. And all of a sudden, whether you look at Valparaiso, San Francisco, Hamburg, or Tokyo, you have the same num names of shipping companies appearing as local actors, CMR, CGM, Hapag Lloyd, and you name them, China Shipping. So all of these cities deal with the same type of global forces, but on the same hand, they're all completely locally different. And these local different, we cannot understand if we think about it only from an economic level, but we have to put it in space. A city that has only one hinterland access will have a different pattern than a city that is connected on multiple rivers. So that's why we, I think we need a type of platform that allows us to think, to compare examples, study best cases, have some cases that react this way. It, there's no one best case in that sense, because every case needs to be locally embedded in its spaces, its institutions, and its history and cultures. So that kind of comparison, I think, is something that we still need. And same uh, in the same way, and that's also why I was really happy to have you all be here today, because I think your contributions to this special issue were more on the social innovation side. And the ones that were not present or that are in the audience often have taken a different, more space-based methodology. So even there, we could have easily another special issue on more case studies, on different approaches and methodologies, diving even deeper into porosity as an institutional um, structure as much as a spatial structure. So yes, there's plenty more to write and we are certainly open to go for a number two, but I think Hernan wanted also to react to this. Thank you, and a hint for, uh, for our researchers in the audience. Hernan, very quickly to, to conclude. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that uh, um, I agree with the caution about uh, the comparability of uh, the comparability of the if the cases, uh, and I would add something as well in terms of uh, the north-south uh, divide, so to say, because I would say that uh, thinking in the in, in, in global terms, you know, in particularly in the case of port cities, uh, tends to somehow erase the histories of uh, inequalities and different developments in in different countries and in different cities and and i would say that for instance porosity is something you know particularly challenging to to address and promote in cities such as uh, valparaiso which is a particularly poor city in a in, in a country which is uh, not as developed as uh, for instance in the netherlands you know and uh, that is then i guess something that has to be taken into account as well and being all of this part of a global networks, production and logistical networks, I wonder as well, what is the, the, the um, so to say, the normative aspect uh, that we need to consider as well, because uh, um, the impacts that are being lived, particularly by the communities, the local communities in, for instance, in Valparaiso, are somehow driven as well by the, the drive of the northerners, so to say, to eat grapes in winter, so to say, see? So I guess that, that is something that needs to be addressed as well. Hmm? And thank you very much. Thank you all. We have reached uh, the end of our webinar too, uh, concluding notes. Uh, first of all, the issue at which this webinar was based on is available fully open access in our journal, Urban Planning. I have now shared once again the link to access, read, share, cite, etc. anytime, anywhere. Second note, the video of this webinar will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel very soon. Our speakers and attendees will be notified once the video is uh, available. I would like then to thank you, all of our speakers, Carola, thank you for uh, your collaboration in this event, to AIVP and Jose Sanchez specifically as well, and Amanda, 
Peter and Hernan for sharing the research uh, results of your articles here with us, and especially, of course, to our audience for the questions and engagement with our speakers. See you all in our next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.